I'd like to thank the Honourable Member very much for his speech and now I look towards Laura Sands to conclude the case for the opposition tonight. Thank you very much and it is always a great, great pleasure and honour to, to follow um, my Honourable Friend, who I would call in the House Honourable Friend, Member of Parliament for Stone, um, who is actually the walking um, dictionary the walking expert in Parliament on EU affairs. So it is always great honour, but also incredibly intimidating. But there we go. We move on to what is actually this debate about. And this debate is about your future. It is about this country's future, but primarily when you vote on this debate, you need to think exactly what it means for you when we look not just in the next four or five years, but 10, 15, 20 years. And I would very much appreciate what one or two of um, the contributors said, and that is, we are European. However much everybody would like not to be European, we belong to the continent. We are attached. We are attached and we have to play our part in Europe. And what worries me always when we have European debates is how strange our language becomes. People with huge amount of self-confidence start to get sort of victim complexes. Um, there seems to be a whole range of identity crises that um, British people have when they start talking about our role in Europe. We seem to lose our sense of um, determination, our sense of ambition, and our ability to actually make our case. Now, Actually, I have to own up. I put my hands up. I don't know whether uh, Bill knows this, but, you know, I come clean. I'm half French and half English. And that, I can tell you, makes it a very, very big challenge, this European thing. I have a mother who is French and who's absolutely dedicated um, to Britain coming out of the EU. And I have a father who actually started the European movement and is a, was a total passionate. He even spoke Esperanto. <laughs> Thank <laughs> goodness I was not... On the point of information, if I may. Point of information? You're going to tell me my mother isn't French? No, I, <laughs> I, I, I was only just... Please in do. Just in case there was some inference the other way, I have... Inference? Uh, I, ha I have uh, two half Spanish grandsons. <gasps> I have a uh, half... Greek granddaughter. I'm not and, sure we're going to go around and, the whole or, room. What I'm saying is, <laughs> we, we, we have, we have, we have, we have the opportunity. We, we, we have much, word, we have much in common. That, is, that we have much in common. Ooh, Come over, Bill. That, that really is, that really is something else. But I am terrified that we end up, <laughs> that we end up having a debate about whether we want to be a parish council or whether we want to actually play a huge role on the global stage. Now, I have to look at all of this. I'm a new member of parliament. Um, you know, everything that I do, I look through the prism of my constituents. And so I come to the sort of Monty Python statement, what did the Romans do for us? Well, I've got companies, I represent East Kent, so we're pretty close to, um, to Europe, but I've got companies there who are accessing 500 million customers. Quite small companies. Now, they're not selling to every 500 million customers, but they are part of a European supply chain. They are employing people in my constituency that are part of that market and that vibrant market. 15% of jobs in my area are associated with companies that are buying and selling to the EU. Now, do come down and tell them that we're going to just walk out and you're going to find them replacement jobs, good jobs we're talking about here. Um, the other issue is when people talk about membership, they say, oh, it's unbelievably expensive uh, to, to be a member of the EU. Well, first of all, I would say it'd be extremely expensive not to be, but if one looks at it, economics, the financials say that we get at least five times our membership in just trade with the EU alone. Now, I'm also perplexed. This is my issue about victims, uh, victim sort of complex and identity crisis. We love membership organisations. This country adores them. 
NATO, I mean, you mentioned NATO, people drop to their knees. Um, you talk about the UN. We're still there. We're at the Security Council. Isn't that, that's brilliant for a country, you know, who might not have quite that international influence that it did when it had so-called the empire. We're members of the IMF. We are good membership organisation players. We get things done. And when people say we're absolutely... The, the extraordinary thing, we are a member of the EU and people constantly say, well, you know, so-and-so was done to, done to us. What do you mean done to us? We have some of the best civil servants that we send out to Brussels. So now we can say we can take responsibility. And I'm very, very happy and I think we should take responsibility for some of the um, gold plating of EU legislation, some of the bad, in some ways more generous approach that we take to Europe and its institutions than other countries do. And maybe we need to be a little bit more of my mother's side. Maybe we need to be a bit more French, a bit more arsy, a bit more difficult. <laughs> I think that's fine. But to say that we're not good at membership organisations or to say that this membership organisation is the organisation that we're actually rubbish at, whereas every other organisation that is a membership organisation is fantastic. Now, I would like to... Can I just ask one point? The difference is, Laura, uh, I hope you'll concede, is that the, the NATO and the IMF don't make our laws and the European Union ah, does. Oh, David, I'm so thrilled you brought that up. What do we have with NATO? In many ways, NATO, we have a much, much more difficult relationship because at least the EU doesn't ask our young men and women to die for it. If somebody goes, if anybody invades Turkey, we are in a treaty to send support, send arms, armed forces to actually go and fight on behalf of Turkey. So NATO has a much deeper, a much more fundamental relationship in that sense. Now that might be because we quite like, and we're pretty good at wars too, and we're pretty good at peacekeeping, and we're pretty good at these international relationships. So all I'm saying is that we are involved in membership organisations, we're good at it, and we are good in Europe. And we've had three things in the last two or three months Number one was George Osborne actually being able to secure um, a very, very important opt-out for our financial services. Secondly, was this week was um, our fisheries minister being able to start the process, very close to ending it, of discards. I have local fishermen. It's really important. And the third thing is that the impossible, David Cameron, with colleagues, working together with alliances around Europe actually gets us um, a reduction in the EU budget. This is not a defeated nation. This is not a defeated nation. This is not a nation that's on its knees cowering to the French or to the, to the, to the Germans. This is a country that is playing its part. What we need to do is play more of a part. As I say, maybe be a little bit more French about it. And my last point is, what does the world look like in the future for you in this room? I think that the next generation is going to have to face some very, very difficult um, global realities, whether that be energy insecurity, water tension and possibly water conflicts, um, food insecurity, and it's a subject that I'm very much involved in. We are going to be in a world where, the res where acquisit acquisition of resources is going to be absolutely crucial. And do you think that we are going to be able to do that just on our own? Our energy security in must in require a strong relationship and a powerful relationship, particularly with Russia. We need to ensure that we have got um, our relationships organised with other regional bodies, let's say in Africa, when it comes to food. We need to be part of regional bodies. We need to be playing our part at that and we need to ensure that that is what's going to underpin our success into the future. I finish with one thing. This country is great. It is no longer, it's not on its knees. But if we are to continue a future where we are going to play an even larger part in the global game, we need to be absolutely clear that being a big player in a, in a very, very large regional organisation is an exciting opposition, uh, opportunity. But being the odd man out is going to get us nowhere. <laughs>